There you go. I am Ryan Kilmer. And on behalf of my co-presenters, Jim Cook, Yolanda suarez Balcazar, and Lindsay Messinger, um, I welcome you to our session today on partnership-based evaluation to support community change. And what we're really focusing on today are practices that can facilitate long-term uh, community university partnerships for collaborations. So as a bit of a roadmap for our session today, uh, I'll start us off by talking broadly about some practices and strategies that are consistent with a partnership-based approach and provide an overview of that approach. Um, Jim will give some real-world examples of the partnership-based evaluation approach in action. Um, Yolanda, um, who we hope will join us at the start of this session, she hasn't, as of the start of this session, she hasn't uh, made it on. So I'm, I'm fearing if she has technical difficulties. Um, but if she's able to join us, she'll talk about evaluation capacity building and an approach that she's used with community-based organizations and nonprofits. And then Lindsay Messinger, one of our favorite partners from our school system here in, in Charlotte and in North Carolina in the US, um, will talk about community university partnerships and give us some important real world recommendations, not only of some things to do, but <clears throat> perhaps not to do. Um, we'll, we'll pause for clarifying questions at the, each, at the end of each segment. Uh, but what we'll ask is for more involved questions. We'll, we'll wait and do some Q&A at the end. And I just want to um, highlight that we have the shameless uh, picture of a book off to the side there of the slide um, that we recently completed this book focused on partnership-based approaches uh, for community change and really uh, focusing on the real world applications across different contexts and settings of this kind of an approach. And so the nature, the content and, and nature of what we're talking about really grows out of um, chapters uh, that we, we wrote for that volume. So first, as I mentioned, I'm going to provide just uh, a 30,000 foot overview of this partnership based approach and, and highlight some key strategies. Um, these are methods that Jim and I have have used for upwards of two decades in our work with various community partners. So as we talk about this, I think it's probably important to highlight some some kind of basic propositions that first off, our approach to evaluation is, is about doing something, not just knowing something. So uh, in our view, that, that we see evaluation as a means of affecting change. So it's not, did a program work or not work? Was the initiative successful or not? It's always a focus on, um, on essentially, uh, oh, I just got a, got a chat that Yolanda has joined, so thank you. Um, it's always a focus on essentially what went well, what went less well, and how can we use data to improve or strengthen the program? And at the end of the, or the initiative, at the end of the day, we really wanna focus on, are we maximizing the, the impact for intended beneficiaries? So that's, that's important as a, a guiding value. It's important when we think about buy-in as well. Um, consistent with that notion, evaluation can and should be used when we think about it as a mechanism for change. So at the point of planning an evaluation, we see it as really critical that we consider how can we use data to improve programs? How can we use it to guide policy change or system change or organizational development? How can it inform decision-making around the use of resources? And sometimes people will talk about with applied research or evaluation, um, the notion of values. And I think it's important for us to underscore that evaluation isn't value free. Our, our social justice values shape our approach to evaluation, right? The data clearly tell the story, um, but, but, the, but our values are an important part of it all. Our values influence the programs or initiatives or partners with whom we work um, or with which we work, right? Ones that are addressing the needs of marginalized populations, ones that are helping provide services and supports for those who have provided uh, who have experienced socioeconomic disadvantage or others that have addressed broader issues of, of social justice. So again, that's a clear part of, of our approach and our values shape our approach as well, that we see it as an important way to, to give voice to and respect the expertise of our partners. So again, we see these efforts around change um, best done as in partnership with important stakeholders. So essentially trying to, to lead with a take home here. 
um, when we, what, are we, what are some of the key uh, benefits or strengths of a partnership-based approach? We see at the end of the day, this kind of an approach can, can really help us in terms of working together to ensure that, that high quality data are being collected um, and are accessible, uh, that our questions not only reflect theory and the literature and science, but are also grounded in the real world and the real world, con real world context and, and pragmatic concerns that we will then also arrive at methods that are more culturally and contextually responsive. And at the end of the day, that then we have more useful science, more effective practice. You might wonder, or some might have questions about in a partnership-based approach, who, who, are, who are our partners? And we often see this as usually a combination of academics, researchers, evaluators, because we are those, um, in, in partnership with community stakeholders. So what kinds of community stakeholders, what are the roles of folks who are often in partnerships? Well, nearly always um, we, we see partners including program or initiative leadership and staff, um, as well as those within an organization or an effort uh, charged with implementing the evaluation. So that's an important piece. Funders are usually, uh, are often part of that partner picture as well. Um, in part because they have a stake in ensuring that our programs are in, and initiatives are effective, that they're achieving kind of the maximal benefits for which we're, we're hoping or for which they're designed. You also might have as partners other organizations or programs that work with the program or initiative um, with which you're partnering. So especially if they provide support to one another or have shared goals or clientele. And then lastly, or not really lastly, and last in my list, um, intended beneficiaries of the program or sometimes referred to as the clientele uh, are also important partners. And you could argue they're often not included, uh, but they should be that they have tremendous stake in, in the effectiveness and, and potential impact of, of the partnership and they offer, or of the program or initiative, excuse me, and they offer a critically important, um, a critically important voice and perspective. I'm sorry, I see that notes have come in in the chat, but it's not letting me, perhaps because I'm sharing my screen, it's not letting me access it right away. So if there's a pressing question, maybe uh, someone else could jump in and let me know. So in brief overview, what practices facilitate partnership? And the piece we talk about, whether it's on our own team or in our practice or with our students or in our classes, that it's all about relationships, that that's relationships form the bedrock of, of any partnership. And so it really, you know, we need to have our work grounded in those relationships and therefore grounded in direct open communication, um, you know, really important explicit work to clarify where we have common interests, where we can see mutual benefits. You'll, you'll, here is clearly implicit, if not explicit, how important it is to attend to process and be really intentional as, as we uh, function in these partnerships. And, and a critically important element then is to appreciate the expertise, strengths, and capacity of our partners and also know what we don't know. So it's really um, of, of great significance that there's this co-learning that occurs, that we're, again, each learning from one another. And then we see is really critical the, the, the need to engage in practices consistent with community-based participatory research or CBPR. Now, as just a note, these kinds of collaborative or participatory steps will often take longer. It'll often take longer. And, and you know, we need to have discussions of objectives and goals and priorities and data sources and, and hone in on methods and, and possibilities. So there's gonna be back and forth typically lots of meetings, um, there'll be steps, missteps, and, and plenty of email. But those steps, while they might take longer, they're really crucial for building a foundation for the work, not only for the evaluation, but ideally for longer term partnerships. Um, we take some pride that we have had multi-year partnerships in the context of mental health, with various nonprofit organizations, with our school system, and, and with other entities. And I think a good part of that is because they know that we're, we're really invested and we engage in these participatory processes. Um, just so we're all uh, using the same uh, definition or coming up to have this on the same page. So here's a, a relatively common or 
um, frequently cited definition of, of CBPR. And I don't want to read it to you, but honing in on, right, that you're, you're collaborating with those who are being studied and those who arguably would be most impacted by the effort or the decision being made, um, joining on all aspects of the research, research process, right? So it's dual ownership, dual ownership of product and process. And then the end point is around action, really wanting to work for social change. So if we do this, right? So again, some specific CBPR practices, again, this notion of shared governance, shared decision-making, um, really jointly learning, co-learning. We're, we're learning what our, our partners bring to the table. You know, they might know something more about in the case of an early childhood program. They more, know more about the early childhood programming, their kids, their families, their curricula. We might know a little something about evaluation design and what the literature suggests and what some measures and strategies might be in the context of mental health or working with a family support program. Again, we know design and some statistical approaches and, and measures and things. They know their families. They know their population, the population with which they work best. So really respecting that, that, um, that knowledge and that expertise. But there's joint discussion too of how to use, uh, find, how to use data, how to interpret findings, mutual ownership of, again, this intentionality of process and product. And our idea there, or part of what really drives that, is the notion of creating an evaluation context that is centered on collaboration and on, and on learning. And so part of what uh, an end goal or an endpoint winds up being there is this is experienced less as if we're outsiders coming in and doing something to the program or to the organization. We're not coming to judge. We're not offering criti critical or punitive feedback. We're not putting a program at risk. Rather, it's a matter of, of working in partnership around how can we maximize the benefit for those you're trying to, you know, the intended beneficiaries of the program. So this increases the probability that the evaluation um, essentially has some measure of buy-in and that results will get used. And so again, really framing it as a maximum, an opportunity to maximize what we know about the program and how we can, can optimize its benefits also increase the likelihood that the evaluation uh, findings get used, get implemented, and, and that we can have the strongest possible product. So as I wrap up my, my component, what we're really thinking about here is that as evaluators, um, as partners, it's important that we're flexible and adaptable and responsive to real world contexts, but there's always going to be a tension between what is the most rigorous uh, approach to the evaluation and what feels most pragmatic um, we need to be able to take into account uh, capacity of our partners and organizations, not burdening their staff and, and how critically important it is to take into broadly account resources and, and other real world factors. We need to be code switchers sometimes. We need to be skilled at being able to communicate with a diverse range of stakeholders and partners. And that's not only in our meetings and that's not only in the planning, but that also could be around the products that we may need to develop multiple products summarizing the results and, and kind of take home points of evaluation. It may be that there's a two or three page uh, version that, that, that winds up online for as a layperson summary. And then you have a six, eight, 10 page version that goes to an executive board or a board of, you know, a board of directors or a school board non-randomly. Or, and, and then it's the longer, uh, more heavy duty one. And again, I'm thinking of one involving uh, Lindsay, uh, where we wound up with a 168 page one that went to the researchers. Um, and, and again, that was not for broader public consumption, but that was for the researchers who were really interested in drilling down into those data. And as last piece is uh, really how important it is, as we're talking about this emphasis on relationships, to make sure that we're also prepared for and responsive to conflict, that we're, we're open to discussing concerns in a way that, again, is really driven by collaboration, and that is we're working to navigate those. The end goal is always how can we maximize the benefit around our, our program or our um, uh, initiatives intended beneficiaries. And so that's, that's really what often uh, can help and drive those decisions. So I will pass the, I will continue with the slides, but I'll pass the baton on to Jim uh, to talk about what these look like, um, what this looks like in the real world. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to provide you with some particular examples of some partnerships. And one of them is the Bright Beginnings program. It's a pre-K program for four-year-olds working with Charlotte Mecklenburg River Schools. Uh, uh, and Lindsay Messinger, our co-presenter and partner and friend here is, uh, is, is part of the Office of Evaluation uh, there in the school system. And then MET CARES, which is a system of care for children with severe emotional disorder, disorders and their families. And so I'll, I'll talk about both of those um, briefly. Uh, for Bright Beginnings, uh, one of the, the realities was that in, uh, when we first started, and actually before we started working with Bright Beginnings, there were some looming budget cuts in the school system. and and uh, a lot of concerns about whether the school system could afford to um, provide pre-K programming when that wasn't their primary and core mission. And in the process of those public discussions, it was clear that the in-house evaluation that had been conducted was not sufficient to be able to make a clear argument about the impact of the program and what the benefits were. So they uh, put out an RFP, a request for proposals to have someone from the outside evaluate the program and we responded to that. And uh, one of the things that happened in, in, in with, there's a, a lot of process there that I won't go into detail on, but we, we were asked to analyze some archival data and we showed them that student gains and verbal ability were, were, were certainly what you might want or expect, but then students left the program, the pre-K program, and entered into disproportionately into the lowest performing elementary schools. Uh, and we could we found that there were some clear uh, differences among those who attended higher performing schools that they did better, and the ones in the lower performing schools just uh, did worse. And their their uh, gains that were made during the program seemed to deteriorate. In addition to that, what we found was that if you look across different schools and different classrooms, then there was a tremendous amount of variability in the performance across, across classrooms, which then led us to wonder about, well, what was that? What was going on there, Ryan? Next. Um, and, and so what we found here was this uh, notion that the children gained both in verbal and social emotional skills. And I think one of the interesting things was that when we started this, we spent some time talking about, well, what did you really want to see? What did you want to, what, what did you want to happen in this program? And what became really clear, for example, is that they're, they had a strong emphasis in their program leadership around uh, social emotional development among kids. But what we also found was that they never measured that. And so we helped them develop some measures that would uh, assess that well within the context of that program. And so we looked at uh, this variability of implementation. We spent a, a year going in and looking at and observing classrooms. And what we found basically was that here are these kids did gain in their verbal and their social emotional skills. Um, and as I said, that if they go to higher performing schools, they did better. But what we also found, which was really critical in looking at the differences in what was going on in the classroom was that uh, kids who were who had higher quality instruction based on the observations we made based on what the program said that they were really valuing and wanting within a classroom, that those kids had better outcomes. And so out of that, we recommended to the school system that they work on improving the coaching. They already had coaching in place, which was supposed to improve the quality or kind of uh, Make, make sure that the, the, the instruction was of a high quality, but obviously we were still having tremendous variability across classrooms, despite the fact that they had coaching. And so we recommended that they do some things to improve coaching and to assess social emotional development regularly, again, which they weren't an, except for our being there, and then to start providing feedback to teachers so they would know how their kids were doing and they would be able to do some things to improve upon what they were the gains they were getting in social emotional development. And the other piece was that the, um, the Office of Accountability at the schools didn't really get much data from some of the, the data that was collected uh, around screening of kids and how they were doing in the program. And so we had some clear recommendations that they increase the program's capacity to collect and use data. Okay. Um, 
But what we found, quite honestly, we provided these this this data, these recommendations, these findings to the school board, and we kind of looked to see well what we can, how we might be involved in the next steps. And essentially, what we were told is that they didn't have any next steps planned, and that um, even though that was not what we understood at the very beginning. And so, but the school system really wasn't ready to act on any of these recommendations. Now, fortunately, the program uh, leadership within the program in the school system did some things to start making improvements based upon some of the findings that we had. So it's like, we felt like these things needed to be done. And so, uh, and the school system wasn't willing to fund any uh, additional work, but, uh, or at least the work that we were recommending. And so what we ended up doing is looking and seeing if there we could find some federal funding to further develop our partnership, to test some enhanced coaching that we worked with the school system and existing coaches and principals and so on to develop and say, well, how can we improve upon the coaching that they're already doing? And we brought in the literature, they brought in their practice and so we came up with um, some ideas about how they could do a better job of coaching teachers. And so we, we helped implement that and then did some um, evaluation of what this enhanced coaching brought in terms of increasing uh, benefits to kids. We also helped them develop, and again, this is all very joint in terms of development, the, uh, some feedback to teachers using the kinds of material they already had in the way of uh, suggestions to teachers about how they could do a good job in addressing social emotional development in kids, but how could they target that specifically to particular kids or particular subsets of kids within a classroom? Um, and then we also work to help them to improve the screening and make that much more efficient and effective and provide better and more data that could then be fed into the school system's uh, evaluation capacity to be able to, to uh, better evaluate how the program was working. Yep, next. And, and so we spent a few years doing that with some federal funding and, um, and, and found that this enhanced coaching did make a difference. And, but again, we're not seeing, we, we, we've seen some changes probably not the ones that we would like to see necessarily, but there have been some changes in how they're doing this coaching and using feedback on a consistent basis to see how kids are doing in terms of their social emotional development. So that was some, some gains that we saw. But let me just go back to the broader partnership. And that is that while we had this funded uh, project that we were working on with them, and that was, I think, a very, very useful one that what we've also been able to do over time is to engage our students in a number of different efforts with the school system that include evaluating some teacher training, uh, some uh, looking at factors related to chronic absenteeism, uh, looking at the impact of school climate, and looking at the impact of, of different programs that were designed to improve social emotional development. The school system has been doing that with older kids and so we have a student right now who's looking at the collective impact of these different programs on how social emotional development is progressing in kids. And I think part of the, the whole idea here is that we go ahead and even we, we had funding from the school system to do some of the evaluation and we had some funding from the feds to do it. But in the meantime, we're doing these other projects and working on things that the school system is interested in and wanting to know something about and using students to do that at no cost to the school system for the most part. And, and so we maintain the partnership over time by having these different sort of sometimes smaller projects that are addressing issues of concern to the school system and to the different programs within it. Let me give you a, a, a very quickly a different uh, effort and that was uh, met cares for looking at children's mental health. And so we spent a lot of time working with the county to develop this uh, effort to transform children's mental health. We then became the evaluators for this seven year federally funded effort. And 
in this process, we served on the management team. We were part of the, how does this program evolve and develop? And I think that's a really nice piece where we're not just making recommendations, but we're sitting at the table to help them implement those recommendations and, and affect change in the, in the program. Um, and, and in this, we were doing a combination of local evaluation. We we're looking at process, the implementation of what the project was trying to do. And then the national evaluation was really focusing on assessing outcomes for kids. We provided lots of feedback regularly um, and we helped then shift the efforts into the school system. And we were then asked to continue being involved with those efforts in addressing children's mental health in the schools. And throughout that also, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, child protective services was a critical part of this broader system of care. So we helped them develop better mechanisms for screening and assessing mental health in kids that were part of child protective services. Um, and while again, evaluation was the intent or was the, the door opener, if you will, of being involved with these different systems, the other piece that I think was really critical is that we were then helping them improve service delivery in a variety of ways. I didn't mention that specifically with regard to the uh, Bright Beginnings program and some of the screening, but it was helping them develop better screening mechanisms so they're better able to assess the needs of kids coming into the program. Brian, there you go. And, and so we have a number of other partnerships. Those are two kind of big ones that we had because they had uh, funding associated with them and so on. But other examples, and, and some of these are a function of the fact that we've been around and involved in the community over a number of years. So Out of the Blue had one of the lead public defenders who's involved with involuntary commitment procedures call and say, well, he was really interested in evaluating the impact of what they were doing. Um, we are right now involved with three different place-based initiatives trying to help them uh, look at how they are improving the uh, lot for people who live in those communities. Uh, we have some students who are working to help develop evaluation capacity in some United Way funded programs and um, some healthcare initiatives that are really community based. We have some folks who have really been looking to us to help them with figuring out how to evaluate the impact of these. And the nice thing is that, again, having students involved helps bridge the gaps in time. There are sometimes with these partners, we don't really have any active involvement with them for several years, but we kind of maintain a relationship in one fashion or another. And then when they have an issue, they know they can come to us and see if they can get some help. And, and it provides marvelous training for students, which helps maintain these partnerships over time. And I think that's it for me. So I'll turn it over to Yolanda. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And good morning to all of those, uh, all of you who are in Australia. Uh, what I'm going to do is take some of the principles that Ryan talked about and walk you through an example. Next, please. So we're going to discuss how evaluation capacity building could be transformative at the level of community organizations. Next. Let's read this as a scenario. This is a common a scenario that we run into almost every single community organization that we have worked with. The staff of the CBO serving people with developmental and intellectual disabilities and the families is preparing for a site visit from one of the funders who has requested in advance a copy of the program's logic model. Although they have developed a draft of the logic model, they panic and call me and say, Yolanda, can you help us? We need your help. We need you to review the model, to review the, the logic model and the evaluation plan. And can you be here with us when they come and visit? How do we support community organizations? Next. Community organizations are experiencing a lot of pressure to show and demonstrate outcomes. So capacity building is when it comes in right? And also empowerment evaluation. So capacity building is the intentional work 
they can easily create a sustainable organizational process that help community organizations incorporate and integrate evaluation as part of their day-to-day -day activities. Although for staff, it can be overwhelming the thought that they're gonna engage in evaluation. And one of the first things that they say to you is, I'm not a researcher, I don't know about statistics. The idea is that if they can integrate it and incorporate it, it can be transformative. And that's what I'm gonna show with one of the examples today. Um, it has to be an intentional effort that the community organization is doing to incorporate and learn about the process and the outcomes of evaluation. Next. What is evaluation capacity building and why is so critical? As we are familiar with, in 1993, the Government Performance and Results Act came into effect. What happened to community-based organizations that were receiving funding from federal sources? They panic. We need to learn about evaluation. Why? They had a long history of reporting outputs and activities and headcount, how many people participate in activities as their outcomes. But they did not were necessarily consistently reporting outcomes, didn't have the skills or the knowledge. And I'm talking about grassroots community-based organizations in urban settings, which is the type of organizations that I have a lot of experience working with. Funders like United Way and other funders start requesting an evaluation plan, a logic model, and funding and obtaining funding for their initiatives became more competitive. Next. So when my colleague Tina and I, a community psychologist, and I were working on this a few years ago, we synthesized the literature and realized that there wasn't an empirically validated model of evaluation capacity building to assist community-based organizations. And there wasn't a model, there were a few models out there, but not necessarily empirically validated with community organizations and a tool that they can use on a daily basis or regularly to improve evaluation efforts. So we developed, we conducted a synthesis of literature and developed and empirically validated a tool called the Evaluation Capacity Building Assessment Tool. And based on our empirical validation, we came up with two key factors, individual factors, attitudes. Attitudes could include ideas they have about myths of evaluation or benefits, motivation. Are they ready to define motivation um, evaluation to be an important process to engage in? Competence, do they have the knowledge and the skills to identify outcomes, to develop a logic model, to develop um, an evaluation plan? And then, also based on our empirical review and validation of our, of our model, organizational factors became critical. Staff may have the motivation and the excitement to learn about evaluation, but if the organization is not there to providing the support, the resources, the training is not gonna happen. So leadership, we speak to communication, leadership style, management, learning climate, reflection, discussions, opportunities to share, and also resources, resources for training, travel, shooting, how work, finding time, and so forth. So what we found is that these two mediate mainstreaming evaluation practices, basically meaning that evaluation can become part of the day-to-day -day activities and use of evaluation results, right? So our community partner has been working with us for over 12 years. And this is a community-based organization that serves individuals with developmental disabilities located in a Latino neighborhood in the city of Chicago in the United States. We have strong partnership with them. Every time they call and need something, one of us or a student is there. And every time we need 
a community organization for student practicum. With my, my evaluation class, the students are paired with programs such as uh, program like the El Valor program, so they can assist them with evaluation. So like Ryan was talking about, we have developed a mutually beneficial partnership that is working together to assist and support one another anytime we need it, anytime they need it, one of us is there. Mutual benefits, we pay attention to diversity and inclusion and context, like Ryan and Jim were talking about, and always thinking about sustained impact. It's not about us collaborating with a community agency and leaving. The project is done, the dissertation is completed, bye-bye. No, we're there for the long haul. Next. So how do we create evaluation capacity? One of the first phases, one of our goals will not only create capacity, but empower them to integrate evaluation and do it themselves. So that meaning the staff with key leaders from the community and participants involved in the process. Uh, we spend some time assessing evaluation needs and readiness for evaluation. We conducted brainstorming sessions, met with them several times, individual group sessions had I remember one of the meetings we had is of paper all over the room where people were talking about and the staff about what they thought was the impact of the program, what their needs were for evaluation. And based on that, we also use the evaluation assessment instrument that, I, that we validated with my colleagues and identified the specific areas that the staff needed support. One of the staff members said, I am motivated to learn about evaluation. Another one said, it takes time away from serving programs. They were hesitant, a little bit worried and nervous about evaluation. We want to learn about evaluation. It's just as they didn't see the connection between evaluation and the programs and the day-to-day -day activities. Next. The second phase, uh, focus on assessing the needs at the organizational level. So the staff might have specific needs. I worry about it. I don't know. But organizations might have another level of needs. Who do we meet? We met with the director of the programs, the supervisor, the director of the agency, right? Because they know more about the organizational. We look at past reports. Uh, we interview them. And we also ask them to complete the evaluation assessment instrument. Interesting enough, the staff were more concerned about the specific knowledge and skills and myths in motivation, while the organization was more concerned about do we have the resources, do we have the time, do we have the technical assistance needed to create capacity for evaluation. Some of the quotes we got from our participants included, we have a high turnover, um, at this, at this organization, our funders require evaluation, so that, that's why they were motivated. We start thinking about our need to get some evaluation training uh, when CARF accreditation, this is the accreditation body was coming. And literally, I was pulling my hair out, and this is how she described it to me. We were focusing, she realized that they were focusing on activities and not on outcomes. And they were looking to moving participants within program, yet not including participants' voices. And that's one of the keys of evaluation capacity building. It can be transformative. Next. So the next phase was to implement evaluation capacity building activities and focus on empowering the staff so they can do evaluation. We conducted a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group sessions with key staff members, and also brainstorming sessions with the community to see, especially participants with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So actually the photo at the bottom is one of our group sessions. We have people with disabilities and we have staff members and leaders and also look at ways to develop organizational processes that support evaluation. We develop a checklist. Uh, we provided a lot of ongoing troubleshooting and feedback to them and pair up students in my program evaluation class to provide ongoing support. Next. So 
So sustaining the evaluation practices over time. Strong leadership is critical. One of the main leaders made a point in making sure they had um, meetings, the staff meetings was gonna deserve a little bit of time at every staff meeting to talk about evaluation. How was it going? What challenges or what were they having? What outcomes were they tracking? What, what was participants' voices? Um, there was a lot of support provided. So we came in and did technical assistance and troubleshooting, but they also got support from United Way and funders. And we also look at issues of transferring of learning. Um, learning, how do you transfer learning? Because one of the things we experienced the first year is that one of the key staff members who received a lot of training and that wasn't our evaluation capacity building champion, she moved to another organization that paid better at the end or at the process. We want to think that she got evaluation skills and that improved her vida. We don't know for sure, but anyway, we don't want to take credit for that. But, but in fact, she did say she added evaluation skills on her resume. So I think it's critical when we create capacity at the organizational level, it's a how to transfer those learning skills, those skills to other staff, and not just the two or three champions working with us. Develop systems and processes and policies with the organization. They end up acquiring a new software that would allow you that allow them to track and document information about participants in an easier way. We applauded and supported that effort. Next. Attending to contextual and cultural factors is critical. This community organization and it might be common among others, who often take a very paternalistic approach to service provision. And here we have adult individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we make sure that the values, because we look at the core values of the organization and the core values of the organization promoted self-determination, empowerment, of people with disabilities, yet in the process of identifying goals, evaluating goals, they were speaking for people with disabilities. So they were using a paternalistic approach, although the core values just spoke to self-determination. Evaluation helped them change that. We made sure that evaluation tools and protocols were accessible to individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Most of the participants and the families are Latinx communities, so we wanted to make sure that all the materials were bilingual and bicultural, and also reflected the ways of thinking of the community. Next. Assessing impact. Assessing impact is critical. And I think one way we were able to assess it is that participants start expressing their needs and speaking for themselves and not the staff. The staff took on the evaluation of involving the voices of participants. So in this picture, we have a, a young adult with intellectual and developmental disabilities really happy because she finally got her goal. That was to get a ticket to be able to travel in public transportation on her own in Chicago. And it was a process of engaging with the staff in evaluation capacity building and empowering evaluation. And one of the staff throughout the process of creating capacity said, we thought we were doing all this great work for people with disabilities, and we were so busy recording activities. And then we realized that we were not necessarily producing the outcomes, that was self-determination and support that they desired. Next. I'm going to go quickly through these next two slides. Um, so what impact we saw? Different ways of thinking. They move away from the paternalistic approach to transforming people with disabilities like by X, giving the opportunity to design. Uh, we measure repeated scores on the evaluation capacity building assessment instrument, and we saw differences. We saw differences in the evaluation reports and products that they were reporting. They, um, the staff sent us evaluation logic models and plans to say just for your feedback. And then we kept those drafts and were able to see the difference from the beginning as 
the evaluation capacity building process un unfolded. They got weight reviews from funders who continued the funding. I'm gonna fly to the next one. Next one. And to close, one of the evaluation um, staff said twice a week staff has time to reflect on outcomes and enter outcome evaluation. They start mainstreaming evaluation practices, um, making sure that evaluation was integrated into their activities. So to close next, a few thoughts. It's an ongoing transformative process. It's a learning process, evaluation and evaluation capacity building, not waiting for the cap, the cup to be fully, to be full. It's always half empty, meaning you're always learning and you created a culture, a climate of learning. It takes time and effort because it's messy. Ryan was talking about the flexibility and we was, Jean was talking about, well, it's not always as suspected and you have to be flexible. It's messy work. So linear thinkers beware because this might not be for you. There's not a straight path, but it's fun. And it's really enjoyable to see the agency calling you back and saying, we wanna continue working with you. Can we have more students? And, and I think it's, it's a process and you really wanna be able to create that climate of learning and make it a sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello all, can you hear me? Okay, good. So I'm Lindsay Messinger and my main role is Director of Research and Evaluation for a large public school district in Charlotte, North Carolina in the United States. I also teach at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte with some of my colleagues on this panel. And while I'm not a full-time academic, I try to understand the perspectives of both community agency staff and university faculty. But today, my remarks are just from the community partner perspective. So as Ryan, Jim, and Yolanda have all mentioned, there are several recommendations for successful community university partnerships. So the first is to build relationships to help develop projects collaboratively. So this is a gradual and perhaps very time consuming process. So it's about making friends or at least strong acquaintances and forming bonds over shared interests and goals. And I would recommend that these relationships are built organically, not immediately prior to a grant application being due. And it may take months or even years for these bonds to form. The second recommendation is to engage in regular direct communication as Ryan mentioned also. So once a project gets off the ground from as early as the planning stages, it's important to engage in regular communication. So the frequency will depend on the stage of the project. For example, during the grant writing stage, as the deadline approaches, daily communication may be necessary. But during the implementation stage, this could be weekly or monthly. But what is important is to set a cadence. And I would suggest setting a cadence that just seems a little too frequent. You can always cancel a meeting or um, a call, and that's better than one party feeling like they aren't in the loop because you're meeting too infrequently. The third recommendation is to foster shared learning. So during these meetings, calls, or informal check-ins, remember that each side has important and relevant information to share. So perhaps the researcher shares opinions about the rigor of the design, but the community partner shares information about feasibility. And both of these perspectives are really important and a project is unlikely to be successful without both of these points of view shared. The fourth recommendation is to remember that community organization leadership and staff already have full-time jobs with regular responsibilities. And this is my favorite one because time and time again, I've been asked to participate in a project and what was initially framed as a small time commitment, maybe just contributing a short section on the evaluation component for us, turns into playing a major role in the implementation or evaluation of a project. And while I really do like to take on new projects, I have to remember that I already have a full-time job and piling on more and more projects simply means that I'm not able to fully commit to any of them. So it's always beneficial to outline the roles and responsibilities up front and for all parties to be open and honest about what is possible given everybody's other commitments. Pointing us back to the second recommendation about communication. And then last, um, 
use dissemination and communication strategies and approaches that support and influence decision making. So I really love this recommendation too. And I recently watched a video by Mike Morrison about creating better scientific posters with just the main point in the center with a QR code and some more information in the margins. So this allows the audience to get the main message really quickly and then decide whether they wanna stick around to ask the researcher more questions. It's like going from this very text heavy image that you see on the left to the simple one on the right. And I've intentionally made the images really small so that you can't see what they say, um, which is kind of like what it's like when you're walking through a poster presentation session. But maybe you can read the one really large sentence in the center of the poster on the right hand side. And I share this example about changes to posters just to say that we can all do a better job of communicating and disseminating our work for academic and non-academic audiences. So while academics have the understanding about the methods and statistics, they don't necessarily want to or have time to read all of the finer details. So it's really useful to be able to boil down all of the learning that took place over months or years into just a few main points and the most action-oriented graphs to transfer insights most effectively. So I'm not advocating for dumbing it down, but just for synthesizing the information um, into the sort of bite-sized pieces that practitioners can actually use. So in my department, in my district, we've implemented the Stephanie Evergreen approach to dissemination that um, Ryan um, alluded to earlier, which is the 1325 model. So this includes a one-page handout, a three-page executive summary, and a 25-plus page report. And so then the folks who really want to get into the methods and the R squared values can read the full report, but most policymakers just want to read the one page handout or maybe the executive summary. And Stephanie Evergreen suggests cutting the chase, and I wholeheartedly agree. So on the next slide, I'll try to illustrate um, some of these recommendations with a real email that I received about three years ago. So I'll give you just a moment to read through this email on the right side of your screen. in the interest of time, I'm going to cut that short. Um, but the first thing that we see in this email is an apology in both the subject line and the first sentence of the email. So I'm already a little bit annoyed because I suspect that what follows is not going to be great. And then I'm right, because then the researcher explains that this is now supposed to be framed as a partnership. I don't know what it was framed as before. Um, but partnerships cannot be one-sided. They truly have to benefit both parties. So there's typically an imbalance in community university partnerships where the university researcher benefits as long as the community partner benefits, but not vice versa. So the third point is that the researcher suggests a randomized control trial. But random assignment is often not very practical in school settings, despite the rigor required for funders and causal claims. So rather than asking whether this is something that we could consider, she just proclaims that this is the new plan. So this goes right into the fourth point where the researcher tells me what will be required. Basically, a copy of all of the data that we have available in our data warehouse and a request for classroom observations too. So this is sounding less and less like a partnership the more and more I read. And I'm starting to wonder, what does the school district get out of this? And so finally, the fifth point, the researcher says that we should move quickly because the application is due in just over a month. As I like to say, there are no research emergencies, but research does require planning in advance. So conversations should begin well in advance of the grant deadline, many months in advance, ideally. Um, and this will help the group understand the needs of both the community partner and the requirements of the funder or the supports that the university faculty can provide. And I know what I'm saying is not rocket science. But I've been working in school districts for a long time now, and I'm sometimes astounded by how infrequently a true partnership model is sought out. So next, I will try to summarize um, what we've said here. So you've heard about the value and the outcomes of a partnership-based approach. And the idea is simply that provided these partnerships are done well, this collaboration will lead to better questions, data, evaluations, and most importantly, actions to improve the lives of community members. 
So thank you. And now in the last few minutes that we have, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Um, so please feel free to write any questions in the chat and we'll try to respond. While anybody is typing in the chat, if you are, I will add um, to the chat the link to the video about um, changing academic posters. It's a 20 minute video, but it's really worth your time. Lisa, may I ask a question to the audience? What challenges they have faced? in partnering um, with community organizations for evaluation. If nobody has a question, they can ask. Well, and I think the reality is we might be up against it time-wise. Um, yes. So we apologize for that, everybody. Uh, and, and, but we do appreciate your attention. We've got our email up there on the, and, and different, Forms of contact information on the on the screen. I know they're recording this. Um, we had a couple of slides of resources and references that we thought might be um, useful or helpful. So again, thank you for coming today. We appreciate your uh, interest and attention, and we're glad to have the opportunity to, to speak with you all this evening or this morning, depending on where you are.